I'm excited to preach this message. I would say to you, as Sean and I prayed about what we feel the Lord speaking to us, uh, that uh, I've been working on this message for my whole life. And uh, it's been developing, and you're going to catch glimpses of those pieces in there. But it only came together about eight, nine weeks ago. Uh, preacher, we look for all kinds of things to trigger us and to help coalesce and converge and bring thoughts into our minds. And uh, I have all these grandsons and one granddaughter and all these grandsons. And we're out in the yard and we're doing something and wrestling around. And I don't know which one of them is because I'm not going to tell you because when I do, then one of their parents would say something. So I'm not going to out anybody. I'm just not going to out. The only one of them sitting in the room. Uh, I'm not going to out anybody. Uh, and when something happened, and one of them turned around and went, Jesus, I'm only human, Pops. I'm only human. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I'm just human. I'm only human. And that struck me, how we have diminished the human experience, how we have devalued humanity, how somehow we've determined that being human is somehow less than. And that's destructive if we begin to devalue humanity, if we begin to diminish what it means to be a human being. Sean's verse, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up the fallow, the hard, the unproductive, unfruitful ground of your life. Plow up that hard ground. One translation says, it says it like this, plow up the hard ground of your heart. You see, out of the heart come the issues of life. And I think sometimes we've allowed ourselves to become hardened. And we have this heart of stone rather than the heart of flesh that he promised to give to us. And when we become hardened, the, the seed that lie within the soil or the soul of the humanity can't spring forth. And if we diminish what it means to be a human being, if somehow being human is an excuse for not being productive, that being human somehow diminishes the reality. And the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, uniquely made in the image and the likeness of God. God said, let us make humankind, let us make man, woman, in the image of of God. You're, you're fearfully, wonderfully, you, you contain the DNA of God. Yeah. That inside of you is God, Christ in you. I'm only human, really? We diminish the reality of what it means. Paul says, You are God's masterpiece. Look at somebody and say, You are God's master peace. You're his greatest creation. You're, 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 you, you sparkle with the glory of God. You, you, you're the radiance of the Lord revealed, crowned with his splendor, the Bible says. I'm only human. Really. God called you very good. God called you the best, the apple of his eye. He, he will give his life for you. Amen. I'm only human. That's not how God views you. God doesn't view you as just human. You, 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 the world we're living in is a bit wonky today, don't you think? The world we're living in is a bit messed up. It's a little strange right now. It, everyone in every place has a sense that something's not right. Something's just not. We're living in a moment where it looks like the world is tearing itself apart, right? In fact, in some conversations I'm in, I would say we're kind of on the verge of panic about what's happening in the world and in America and in every place we turn. The world seems to have lost sense of itself. I think it's because we've lost a sense of what it means to be human. There's so much inhumane realities that are going on. We've lost a sense of the value of human life. 
And we're so desensitized to it because everywhere you turn now, you see human life being destroyed, which is the purpose of the enemy, to destroy the image of the living God. And we have lost a sense of value of what it means to be human. I think it's because we don't understand God's value of humanity in the first place and that we were and are the extension of the reality of who he is. What does it mean to be human, to live the human life the way Jesus lived this life? To live this life the way of Jesus, to be fully human. Jesus did not come to deliver you from humanity. He didn't come, he came to enact the fullness of what it means to be a man and a woman made in the image of God. He didn't come to deliver you out of humanity, he came to empower you in being human. You, you, you are a human being. You, 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 we've been trying to make everybody have spiritual experiences, and God has come to empower you to have a human experience. You are spiritual beings with the privilege of living in the flesh. You, out of all of the things and all the opportunities that that... That, that that seed had to create. It created you so that you could have the divine, wonderful experience of living in the flesh. Hallelujah. And do you know most of Christianity is trying to get you to escape this moment? And yet you have been given the honor of being the radiant expression of God in November of 2023. You've been chosen to live right now. You, you, there, there's an old Jewish proverb that says, there are angels marching before you, shouting, behold the image of God. Yes. Behold the glory of God. That's you. I'm just human. Really, you've diminished your own value lost your own identity and its relationship and its connection with being authentically human. See, Jesus came to show us how the way to be human. The greatest human who was ever born, who ever lived is Jesus. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you that, that picture of a, of a wooden fence or a slatted fence that has gaps in between it, you know, and that I've been in places in the world where they build those high fences to, you walk down the road and all you see is the road in front of you and right beside you, if you look through the slats, you'll recognize on the other side of that fence is this beautiful landscape of northern England and it's, par it's right there, but if you're not careful, you don't look through the slats, the fence can conceal it. Scriptures are like that. Many, many people extrapolate scriptures in a literal way, trying to determine who is and who isn't loved by God. Truth. Who is and who isn't. The scriptures, when they're, when they're taken out of context, and context is everything, but when they're taken out of context, then, then the scriptures, Jesus said, you search, you read the scriptures, and they reveal me. Anytime the scriptures are used and they're not revealing Jesus, then it's... And Jesus comes revealing who the Father is. Jesus comes making known to you the Father's love for you. How the Father values and sees you. And, and, and if you can ever see who God really is, see the way Jesus lives the human life, you'll know who you are. To find God is to find yourself. To find yourself is to find God. Jesus comes to reveal what it means to live. But many, many, many people search the scriptures and remain pharisaical in their reading of the scriptures in order to judge other people and determine who is and who isn't loved by God. Ever looking and never perceiving the reality that Christ is the love of God. Mm. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a human being. You're the hope of the world. Christ, the Bible says that Christ is in a human vessel. And that the Christ that's in you is the hope in the midst of a crazy world. Right. Superman ain't coming. God has sent you into the world. That 
the world might see and know who God is by the way you live your life. That you are a human expressing the love and the presence of God. The Hebrew writer says that Jesus is the radiant glory, the express image, the original intent of design, and that he has become flesh so that you can see what you're capable of. You do understand that everything Jesus did, he did as a human being. The Bible says he emptied himself, that everything Jesus did, he did as a human being. Not as Superman, but as a normal, ordinary human being. He removed the money changers. He cast out demons. He stooped into the dust to raise someone up. And within Nicodemus and Zacharias, he saw the potential of what it means to be a child of God. You are not limited because you're living in the flesh. You are not limited because you're having a human experience. In fact, you are God's intent to make known all that he is, to reveal the reality. People have lost their sense of being human because they've lost their identity as it's connected to the Christ. Hmm. Jesus looked at the demoniac, remember? He looked at the demoniac. He said, what's your name? And the demoniac says, Legion. Remember this story? Legion. Legion. Now, now, come on. You don't have to be a scholar to get this. A legion is the description of an army. The Romans had legions of soldiers that would go into and occupy a land. And they would destroy and rob and diminish the land and its people to the degree that they were diseased and dysfunctional. What is your name? And he goes, a legion has taken over me. A legion in my society has robbed me of the reality. I don't even have a name anymore because the structures of society, the occupational forces have destroyed what it means to be a human being. Can I tell you, there are structures and systems of man that are trying to conquer and rule and destroy. And their societies and people today are under demonic influences because of a legion of humanity that's decided to destroy other humanity. That's possession. And Jesus delivered him from the world. Delivered him from all those oppressive ideas. And the man came to his right mind. He became human again. Amen. Human again. Not following the ways of the world, but free to be who he was created to be. And he said, Jesus, let me go with you. And Jesus said, oh, no. I want you to go back into the world that is filled with dysfunctional, destructive, oppressive. And I want you to free other people of the thing that I have freed you of. I want you to go do what I did for you for other people. Do you know other people are waiting on you to free them from the limitations of this world? Amen. That we, oh, I'm just human, Pops. Really? You're carriers. You're carriers. You're, you're supposed to be infected with this stuff. Paul at one point says, I'm fevered with it. I'm overwhelmed by it. I, I, I can't get away. I'm compelled to see other people go free. To see other people become flourishing human beings, producing and being fruitful. We need to break up the fallow ground, the hard ground of our heart, and let the DNA, the seeds that have been implanted within us, produce a fruit that frees not just us, but all people. Oh, my God. The church has such potential, and they're being acquiesced by the ways of the world. Oh, well. See, the story of Jesus is about how to be human, how to recover being human. So many people are trying to be spiritual that they forgot to be human. Jesus didn't leave a sacred book. He didn't leave symbols. He left an embodied people. 
He left a body. He said, you're the body of Christ. He left people with a human heart. He left people that had been filled with the Holy Spirit, the love of God. See, the kingdom of God is not some future reality. The kingdom of God is a present reality that's constituted by people who have been loved and are, are giving love, whose relationships are rooted in this reality of grace. Amen. It's a gift we've been given to live with each other differently than the world lives with itself. Jesus said, if you've been baptized with me, you've been raised to newness. Say newness. newness. New, say, <laughs> newness of life. That any man that's in Christ is a new creation. It's a new kind of human being. That when Jesus came, he left a new kind of human, a human that didn't live like the world, like the Pharisees, like the Romans, but lived like Jesus lived. Oh, my God. This isn't about getting to go to heaven. This is about releasing heaven. This is about manifesting heaven on earth. It isn't about getting your 401K. It's about... Oh, See, the goal needs to be to be human. The goal is not to get to heaven. The goal is to be a fully restored, reconstituted, recovered, redeemed human being. Manifesting the Christ in our life, in our words, in our actions, in our relationships. I can't fix the walkiness of the world, but I can look at you. I can look at you. And say, listen, in your family, in your life, in your home, in your world, could you just be human? <laughs> value other humans? Value yourself? Recognize that buried within you is the latent potential of God? Yeah. That he came to give you abundant, eternal life, and that is now, not somewhere after now. See, real discipleship is not spiritual formation. Real discipleship is the reformation of a human being. What does it mean to get up and put your pants on every day? What does it mean to go out into a world that's opposed to you? What does it mean to go out into a world that's got all kinds of problems and troubles? He promised them. And yet, have good cheer. What does that mean? That means that somehow... God has empowered you to live in this moment, in this state, and reveal him to the world that's around you. And the only way, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It's by grace. I've worked harder than you, than you all, but not I, but the grace that works inside of me to live in gratitude to the fact that there is an invisible power on the inside of us that is causing us to be other than an animal. I'm not a human animal. You do understand that for five days he spoke and made ducks and birds and hippopotamuses, but when he got ready to make you, he did not speak. When he got ready to make you, he put his hands on the clay. He got personally involved in shaping your nose. He didn't just speak it. He got personally involved and created the way you look. You became his masterpiece with his fingers. He formed you in a womb, knew you. And after he had formed you, he took his breath. He took his life and he breathed it into you. And so that there's no way you can ever be separated from him because everything within your body lives dependent upon his mercy and grace. And all you got to do is stop holding your breath. I'm not going to breathe. Then you'll die. How many of you know I don't have to work to breathe? I just breathe. Amen. Unconsciously, I'm, you are not a creature. I'm just human. That's like saying I'm just a duck. Quack, quack. I'm just a creature. No, you're a child of the living God, created in the image and the likeness, and you have all the attributes of God. Yes. Know ye not that ye are? 
oh, I'm only human. Are you kidding me? And religion has done this. Religion has reduced you to your behavior. Religion has reduced you to how you perform and determined that you're good based on their evaluation of your performance. And before you ever perform, God said, you're very good. Before you ever made a mistake, made anything right, he said, you are very good. I'm sorry, but the world is created to evaluate performance and determine your value. And God said, you have value whether you ever perform for me or not. And we live in a world that has a legion of teachers that are telling our kids they have to behave in order to be valued. And they're wrong. Woo, I won't get anywhere with that statement. (laughs) Though it be true. Only if you can run the football 80 mile an hour are you valued. Only if you can throw a basketball. Only if you can perform. And God said you're valued because I said you're valued. You're a human being. And I chose you and I formed you and I molded you. And to that grace, I simply say, thank you. I live in gratitude. They were neither thankful nor did they worship him, and he gave them over to the silliness of their minds. Have you ever seen anybody that's just silly? It's silly to think that you can take care of yourself. It's silly that you think you can live independent from God. It's silly that you think your thoughts are better than his. It's silly that you think you can create a form of government that will match heaven. It's silly to think that you have rights. That's silly. I don't need to protect my rights if I have a God that protects me. See, the whole fall of man is when we bought into the illusion that we could do it ourselves. We bought into the lie, the illusion that God wasn't for us. We need to break up the fallow ground. I think we're trying to live on one acre when he's given us a thousand acres. I think we're trying to live on a little bit of knowledge when God's trying to give us all the knowledge. That we need to break up those areas of our life where we've become hardened to two. And, and we need to allow the soil of our lives to begin to be plowed again, to be watered again, that we can produce whatever it is he has planted with inside of us. Do you understand that you were designed for a great accomplishment? Oh, you didn't get you were you were designed for great accomplishment. You were engineered for extraordinary success. That the seeds of the genius of God's greatness are on the inside of you. That the potential that's inside of you is so valuable that my job is get to, to simply get you to open your minds that there is more to you than meets the eye. I'm only human. Are you kidding me? You are carrying the manifestation of heaven, of the promises of God on the inside of you. Break up the ground. Put some water on your life. Dare to dream of a life that's truly human. Dare to dream a big, big dream that you can live the way Jesus lived. That Jesus wants to live through you and in you that you can discover what it means to live the way Jesus lives, that you can look through the lens of Christ's eyes. Listen listen to me. When Saul was persecuting the church, you remember that story? Saul is going to kill Christians, and Jesus arrests him. Remember this? And he, he, he looks at Saul, who would become Paul, and he says, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting the Christians? He didn't say, why are you persecuting my brothers or my sisters or my friends? You see, if I poke Hampton in the eye, I poked Hampton. 
And and the Bible says that we are members of the body of Christ. And if you step on my foot, you stepped on my foot. Why are you persecuting me? He takes it personally. You are members of the very body of the Christ. Then what's in the head is in your kidney. What's in the kidney is in the head. That I can't amputate. That you are connected in union with God himself. That you, you, you are one with, he chose to put himself in the flesh. Not once. Not once. Jesus was the first begotten. He was the firstborn. I don't know which one I am, but I'm not a number. I'm Quentin. And Jesus is in this flesh. And this is his flesh. And if you poke me, you did it to him. Oh, you didn't get this. If something touches you, it touches him. Then that that must mean I'm only human. No, 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 no. (laughs) A human being is filled with, controlled by, latently hidden inside of you is God himself. Amen. Mm. Do, do, you know, I've learned they take your vital signs when you go to the hospital. Did you know that? <laughs> they check to see if you're moving. They check your reflexes. If you got any movement there, that's a vital sign. They, 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 they want to know if you're breathing. If you're not breathing... They want to know if you're eating, you're pooping. I hear it all the time. You got to eat, you got to poop, and you got to move. Those are vital signs. Is there a heartbeat? These are vital signs. Sometimes I look at Christians and want to go, are you breathing in the presence of God? Are you eliminating things you need to be eliminating? Some things are meant to pass through your life, not stay. Do I need to get? No. You need to be eating the fresh food of God. If you're not, your vital signs are, some of your vitals are a little low. And you, you you do understand that dirt that's been divinized is more value than silver and more value than gold. That dirt that is breathing the breath of God is more valuable than money. And the world has forgotten that. They would see people hurt for the sake of money. They would enslave people, sell people, destroy people for an agenda called money. Are you listening to me? And that is legion. That is legion. Jesus came to free us from that way of being and that way of living. He came to restore us to the presence of God. He came to recover the ground of our being. Peter says that you are partakers, sharers, Inheritors of the divine nature of God that you might escape the corruption that's within the world. He said, I have given you promises. I have given you my word. I have given you my word that you might share, partake. And then he said, and I'll never leave. Listen, my goal is to become human. To be so united with God that in this human experience, God can flow to be a better human. Not to be having, listen, I am a charismatic. Most charismatics worship the feeling that they get when they have the experience. And miss the point that the experience is to change you. Liturgical people worship the manner in which they do the communion. And miss the point. It's not the manner in which you do it. It's the change that comes to you. Don't worship the act. 
Some people read the Bible so they can impress other people with their knowledge of who's in and who's out. You missed the point. I read the scriptures so that I'm changed. I receive communion that I'm changed. I speak in tongues that I'm changed because I want to live his way. Sometimes I speak in tongues because I don't want to speak in English what I'm thinking. <laughs> you don't want it. Never mind. He, Jesus said, I am the vine. And you are the branches. Have you ever seen a vine? That's the grapevine. And the branches are an extension of the vine. I am the vine, and you are my extensions. I am the Christ, and you are the extensions, the continuation of the Christ. You are the... Notice he did not say, I will be the vine, and you will be. No, he said, I am, and you are. Say with me right now. I am the manifestation, the extension of Jesus to this world right now. I'm only Jesus. I'm not I'm only human. Jesus, Pops. Uh, can I tell you, I preached this sermon to boys before I preached it to you. My best sermons are not here. My best sermons are to my grandchildren. You want to know why? Because I love them more. Just, just so that you understand. Beca because they need to know the truth, not what your Christianese popular shelf regurgitations of the opinions of men are. I could care less what the televangelist says. Me too. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, you're a human being. You, 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 you have a choice to respond to that reality. It's interesting to me how we have become the most self-educated, self-aware, self-whatever, but we can't seem to solve the problems of our moment. I have a couple of questions. What if being a human being as a Christian in Jesus' way meant learning how to get along with other people? What if it didn't have to do with speaking in tongues and healing everybody? What if it had to do with learning how to get along with the people you live with? I mean, let's just make it simple. How well are your relationships right now? What if being Christian meant learning how to get along with other people, how to have a moral code of respect? Please, thank you, manners. What if it meant learning how to love what God loves? What if being human means risking being wrong? Oh, that, I can't be wrong. If I'm wrong, I can't be right. If I'm not right, then I'm wrong. What, what if living the human life means being grateful for that life? Whatever it is. What if, what if being human means to have an attitude and a lifestyle of generosity? Of understanding that whatever we have, he gave. And thus we give it back. What if being Christian means dreaming bigger and wilder dreams about how 12 people and then 120 people could begin to live a life that so reflected Jesus that they thought they were? Yep. What, what if we could dream today that each one of us could live a life that is so reflective of the Christ that they called us Christ-like? You do understand the hope of the world is not found in an election. The hope of the world is not found with more power. The hope of the world is the recovery of what it means to be a human being. Amen. Releasing and living the love of God. Amen. And your job is not to argue or to debate, but your job is just to become everything God created you to become. That's your calling. My vocation is not to preach. My vocation is to release the presence of God.
for other people. Yeah, but do you smoke? Do you drink? Do you run? Listen. Again, the world is evaluating behaviors. Christ is shaping souls. Christ is developing the greatest ambition that I have today is to have been to be and to become a fully restored human being who reflects who he is and and can I tell you it's not easy to be human the hardest thing I've ever done is to be human the way Jesus was human it's hard. It, it, it takes a long time. Thank God he's patient with me. It's going to take a lifetime. It's a slow process of becoming. That's why Adam and Eve reached out and just grabbed the fruit, is they didn't like the process it was going to take for the Father to mentor them into his likeness. They, they abdicated his parental guidance, and like the prodigal son, they ran off and tried to become on their own what only the father could mentor them to be. We, we, it, becoming like Christ will take your lifetime. It, it's a long, steady movement. See, Jesus can change a heart in a moment, but it will take a lifetime of heartbeats for that changed heart to become like Christ. Hmm. So, how does one become authentic? A number of years ago, the Lord asked me this question, and I pondered it. What, what does an authentic Christian look like? Today, I just want to know what an authentic human being, a real, transformed, flourishing human being. How, how do, what do I, everybody wants to know, what do you do? Just a few little things this morning. How, how about... And it, can I tell you something? It's not something you can achieve according to Romans 5, 17. It's something you receive. But, but how about stop referring to people as us and them? How about a real human being doesn't see us and them. Me, and you, it sees us. How, how about this? How about start accepting people? for who they are as human beings and that we have a common reality. How about building some bridges between... I can remember sitting in front of a gentleman who I, I knew had to be more holy than I. He had... He, I remember sitting in front of him and, and he kicked my foot and he said, the music is the same. I thought he had lost his mind because I know he loves opera and I love Garth Brooks. But what he was saying is we're both humans who have been baptized into Christ. And we share the same human experience. How about build some bridges and value each other as being something less than? Mm. How about how about this? What What if we could move into the impossible? Do do, do you know in a few weeks we're going to celebrate the birth of, we're going to celebrate the incarnation, God becoming. That's impossible. I love what Mary says. How can this be? How, how, how? How could I become a new kind of Christian? It's a resurrection. You're going to have to leave your reasoning behind. This is a faith journey. To believe in the impossible, that God joined himself to you so that you are now joined with God. It's an impossibility. See, real humans believe that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What if if you just started believing, I can become like Christ? I can live the Jesus way. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Real Christians are people who refuse to conform to the limitations of this world. I refuse to accept the limitations of this world. I can love my neighbor. 
I can love my enemy. I can overcome evil with good. I can forgive 70 times 7. I can die to myself for the sake of other people. That's possible through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us, that greater things can be accomplished. Listen, I want to choose to be that kind of human that believes that each one of us in this room could become like Christ and thus change the world in which we live. See, the real opposition to us is not the non-believer. You've got to quit fighting the agnostics. You've got to stop fighting those that don't believe what we believe. That's not the real enemy. The real enemy is the Christian who's a skeptic. The real enemy is the Christian that's sitting in this room and his heart has become so hardened that they're skeptical of the power of God that could change them into the image and the likeness of God. Lose your skepticism. Break through that that, that disappointment that you had earlier in life. Break through it. Quit being skeptical that God is in you and wants to do through you greater things than you've ever imagined. Get over being hurt. Oh, good Lord. It's your and mine sacred calling to live profoundly human lives, to become fully alive. What's it mean? How do we do it? Maybe start doing what's necessary. Just do what's necessary. And then what's possible? Do what's necessary. And do what's possible. And eventually what will happen is you'll be doing the impossible. See, God imagines that you can do more than you can imagine. He says it's more than you can imagine and more than you can comprehend. God imagines you doing. Hope is believing in stuff unseen that no one else would dare imagine. But I have a hope of knowing that Christ in me can so transform me that we can do and act and live the way Jesus acted. Human beings conceive the inconceivable. We believe that God has created us to reveal the face of God to the world. I'm only human. Are you kidding me? We're living in a culture that so diminished the human experience that we've robbed ourselves of the power of the Christ that can come through our touch, come through our words. We must resist any diminishing of the category of humanity. And if your Christianity diminishes another human being, then your Christianity is not of Jesus. If your Christianity diminishes another human being, then it is not Jesus. Because Jesus stoops to the lowest and the least and the lost and redeems them out and reveals to them who they really are. There's a lot of diminishing faith that just has to stop. I didn't get one good amen out of that. I worked on that line. (laughs) We have to resist. Jesus ushered in a new creation, a new way of living, a loving without limits, without conditions, without measure without keeping score? How do I become a human being living in the reality of the Christ? How about be nice? How about stop spreading poison to other people? How about giving other people the benefit of the doubt? They were just having a bad day. (laughs) Oh, well. I have a dream. I do. I have a dream that every one of you would realize the great potential of what it means to be a human being. Living filled with and under the control of the power of the Holy Spirit. The question is not so much how do I become an authentic Christian. A better question is what's keeping me from becoming a better human being. What's holding me back? Why is that area of my life so hardened to the potential of the possibility? What has caused me to be so cynical that I wouldn't believe 
that every individual has the potential of being filled with the presence and the power of the why am I holding my breath and not breathing in his presence and breathing out his power whatever Christianity is it certainly cannot be limited to a future orientation faith is now how do I become a human being releasing the very potential, the energy, the power, the glory, the radiance of God. I, I can't fix the troubles in the world, but I can perhaps lead you to value yourself, to value others. Maybe in your particular life, you could break up the fallow ground of your life and allow the nature of God to come through you. How? Maybe if, if we just succeed in our particular little world, maybe collectively that will have an effect on the universal. Instead of arguing about the whole thing, how about just taking responsibility of your thing? And if we all take responsibility for our thing, maybe the synergy of us taking responsibility of our thing you think? Maybe 12 could become 120, 120 could, could become 3,000, and 3,000 could... Because you can't overcome evil with good. Amen. I do believe that. Evil will never overcome evil. Right. Ever. I realized a few years ago that everything in this Bible was about Jesus. Jesus. And that if I would stop allowing the Pharisees to use it as a bat, that every verse in here reveals Jesus. Every story in here is about the Christ. And that, that I, 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 I can read any scripture, any story in there, and I can find the presence and the power. Lord, how do I become a better human being? And I found one verse. And honestly, over the last three to four years, I have realized if I can just allow that verse to be embodied in my life. I meditate on it constantly. I, I, the whole Bible is so complex and so complicated and so vast and so theologically full that I, I need it to be a little simpler and I just need to. And there's one verse. It's found in Psalm 39. And I've realized if I just focus on this, It'll create an atmosphere where I can experience the potential. of it. It's sufficient that if I can just practice it. I said, I will take heed of your way. I said, I will take heed of your way. I will pay attention to the way Jesus lives. How Jesus responds. How Jesus treats. How Jesus gives. I will take heed of your way. I, I, I think it's time we stopped trying to be Catholic Christians, Protestant Christians, Pentecostal Christians, Methodist Christians. Maybe we stop trying to be blue or red or liberal or conservative. Maybe we ought to be Jesus Christians. Maybe we ought to be Jesus people. Maybe we ought to just live the way of Jesus Christ and quit trying to put ourselves in positions where we don't have any reality to be. I'll take heed of your way. For the last four years, Dale, all I've tried to do is take heed of what does it mean to practice the way of Jesus? Just practice living the human experience the way Jesus lived it, comma, that I will offend not with my tongue. I'll take heed to live the Jesus way, and I'll work not to use my tongue to be offensive to anyone. One translation says, to the ungodly. See, sometimes we defend our tongue if they're ungodly. Do you understand that on the power of your tongue is life and death? 
that on your tongue is creation and hope. And that if I could just heed to live the Jesus way and not offend with my tongue, it may take a lifetime, Pete, but this thing, this body and soul and spirit will be changed. I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for me. Because there's someday I want to stand in front of him and say, I did not waste the talent that you gave me. I did not waste the gifts that you deposited. I did not waste the seeds of the potential of being like my father. That I want you to be glorified in my life. Not so that I can prove to somebody else I'm better than them, but because he gave me life. And I don't want to waste it I will heed your way, and I will not offend with my tongue. That's the way you become truly human, authentically human. I'm just human. (laughs) You can change the world by changing yourself, by making a choice. To be like he is. And you you won't do it alone. If you just make the choice, he'll give you the grace. If you'll just make the decision, he'll give you the grace. And when you fail, and you will, make another choice to get up tomorrow and do it again. Don't allow religion to beat you up by your failures. But understand that in the midst of your failures, he gives even more grace. For which I am extremely grateful. Look at your neighbor and say, you are a human being. The latent potential inside of you is the manifestation of God on the earth. Maybe meet one another. Maybe whoever you meet tomorrow, look at them differently. Look at them as a human being. Maybe maybe they've been caught in the dysfunctionality and the occupation of a legion. And maybe your job is to help free them so that they can realize, come to their own, right? Instead of be offended by them, maybe help them, be kind to them. Can I just simply say, I believe in every one of you. I believe that every one of you, all of you, I believe every soul out on the streets of Hudson today are valuable. And they're human beings. (laughs) Did you get anything out of that this morning? I hope it inspires you. I hope it feeds your faith. I hope it is a part and a piece of the transformation. Pastor and I are going to spend the next several weeks about the realization how the birth of Christ was not a one-time event. That if we just look back and see Christmas as something that happened 2,000 years ago, that we're just celebrating an event. But if we view today as the moment that the Christ is born in you every day and that we're living in the incarnational reality of Christ in us, that'll change your life. It's not just an event of the past. It's a present manifestation of the baby that was born in Bethlehem of the man that died on the cross, 
of the Christ that rose from the tomb and of the potential that's in you. Stand with me this morning.